Welcome to Virtual Futures Salon. Uh, for those who are brand new to this event, Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick during the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, who's here in the room, it arose at a tipping point of the technologization of first world cultures. Whilst often it was portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of acceler accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, uh, its actual aim, hidden behind the brush steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic profits, and the techno parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. And what these events did was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon series, and we're hoping it's going to be a series at least once a month in this space, completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and start work on the 21st. So let's begin. It all started in, 19, in the 1950s when we started to compare the brain with, to a general purpose computing device that processes our reality and stores our memories. Today we have increasing accessibility to new tools and new technologies that have been designed to measure and record the electrical activity of the third largest organ uh, on your body through a process called EEG. This work has powered gaming devices in the case of Focus Pocus, toys in the case of Mindball, consumer platforms in the case of Emotive, and even DIY platforms such as OpenBCI. But enter the new kids on the block, collectively known as Cognitive Enhancement Devices, or CEDs, if you hear that term. Namely, three key devices. Transcranial direct, uh, direct current stimulation, or TDCS. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. And cranial electrotherapy stimulators. These devices not only read the brain, but also attempt to influence it. And that's key uh, to what we're going to discuss today. But let's face it, these new kids on the block, uh, well, they've been hanging around in academia and they've been hanging around in clinical settings for at least the last 15 years. But now they're entering puberty. And they promise to stimulate the brain in a way that is painless, inexpensive, and safe, apparently. So the promise grow goes. Finding it hard to sleep, looking for improved fitness outcomes, shock. Feeling depressed, not feeling productive enough, want to increase mindfulness, zap. Feeling overworked, overwhelmed, zip. Need to temporarily improve your coordination and gaming skills. Oh, e-gamer, do we have the prefrontal electrical stimulators for you? Your child underperforming in school? Uh, well, perhaps we now might know the answer. What? You seriously thought that evolution would upgrade this brain? Well, let's see. Forget pharmacology, especially the students on college campus, and I'm looking at a particular couple who are cramming for their exams. Instead, just apply a weak electrical current of about one milliamps to the brain for about less than 20 minutes. And as the currents pass through your skull and penetrate your scalp, allow them to alter your spontaneous neural activity. Feel your neurons fire? Well, hopefully not. After all, they did promise it was painless. So what do these devices specifically enhance and how? Well, surprisingly, we know very little. But whether we like it or not, suddenly that three pounds of wetware inside our head has become a platform for experimentation and exploration. Long-lasting effects? Well, hopefully for about 12 months. Don't try this at home? Well, the feasible for home use, especially when purchased outside of a clinical setting. These devices, after all, are unregulated. But why try it at home when you can try it at your local biohack space? The reality is this. The market for uh, these sort of, sorts of enhancement technologies is 
expanding. And thanks to folks like, like Andrew, these devices are already crossing international borders, which means we have some questions to answer especially those tricky ethical and, and legal uh, questions that we all start pondering when these sort of discussions arise. After all, we're being promised the ability to modulate and manage our cognitive and affective states and even our well-being. So, should we be controlling which products are approved for sale? What are we still missing in terms of data and how these devices work? Will tighter regulation of device makers' marketing and manufacturing standards only hinder development and innovation? How do we ensure cognitive liberty and ensure an open and proactionary approach to the develop to development of DIY devices? How do we effectively educate and in some cases warn the public? Well, this panel brings together representatives from multiple spheres where brain stimulation operates. And so, to answer some of those questions, and hopefully many more, are our esteemed panel. And I want to kick off by introducing Nick Davis. So Nick Davis is a senior lecturer in psychology at Manchester Metropolitan University. And Nick, you've been, well, you've been working in these devices in an academic and clinical setting for a while. Could you kind of give us your interpretation of what neurostimulation is? OK, so what we're talking about is the brain. And we have a question. We have a question about how the activity of the brain leads to everything that we experience. So everything we're experiencing right now, our sense of time, our sense of space, our sense of vision, our sense of just being, is created somehow in the brain, we believe, most of us believe. You don't have to believe that, you're welcome not to. Uh, but we have a question. We, we can see the brain changing, we can see electrical activity in the brain, we can see uh, changes in blood flow using an MRI scanner. So we know that the brain is doing something when it's doing something. What we don't know is how we can relate things that we can measure to things that we experience. So here's a, an opportunity. So here's a tool we can use. We can use brain stimulation to get energy across the skull. So the skull is a really good insulator. It's very hard to get things across the skull. But we can get energy across the skull using magnetic pulses or using electrical energy to try to influence activity in the brain and see if that makes a difference to behavior. So for example, if I have a hypothesis that this part of the brain is particularly interested in completing the times crossword, then I can put some energy into this part of the brain and it makes me slower at the times crossword. Well, that's told me something about how this part of the brain works and how the times crossword works in my behavior. So that's a useful tool, and scientifically, that's a very useful thing to be able to do. It's very useful to be able to stop people being able to do things as well. It tells us that we've affected a system somehow. We don't understand the whole system, but like prodding a piece of a car, we've learned something about what each thing does. So we have these devices. We have these electrical devices and magnetic devices, and I think today we're mostly going to be talking about electrical stimulation because that's what's more commonly available. So these devices affect our brain's uh, activity and therefore it affects our behavior and it mostly makes us worse, generally makes us worse. And scientifically that's fine. I've learned something about the brain by making somebody worse. But that's not exciting enough. What's really exciting is the possibility of changing the polarity of the device we're using, turning the electrodes around using the other end of the battery. And now we can increase activity in that brain area and hopefully and it doesn't always work, but hopefully increase our performance. Make me faster on the Times crossword. That will be very exciting. I think Inspector Morse's record was, I'm not sure, 11 minutes. I, somebody will know. If I can beat Inspector Morse on that Times crossword, I'll be very happy by giving myself a little shot of electricity. So we have some questions. We have some questions about how this works. We do not know how these devices affect our brain and therefore affect our behavior. These are open questions that we, we neuroscientists need to understand in order to work out exactly what we're doing and what they are for. We also don't understand safety. Because we don't understand the mechanism of how these things are working, we don't understand how to make them safe, how to establish a safe dose in the way that we can uh, decide we can give people a, a drug based on kilogram of body weight. 
So that's a safe way of dosing uh, a drug. We don't know how to do that for brain stimulation. So we are operating in a place where we've got a lot of ability, but not very much knowledge. And that, to me, creates danger. And so I worry about the danger. I worry that we all get very excited about the reports we read in this scientific literature or even in the popular press. And people are excited and people have access to devices that can do things to their brain. But I don't know if this safety message is getting through. And I think that's a very important thing we need to think about. So Roy, you work in um, these devices. And I want to introduce my um, sort of next panelist, uh, Roy Cohen Kadosh, who's a professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University of Oxford. And you pretty much wrote the book on the stimulated brain. And you work with these devices in a clinical setting as well. And you've found very specific outcomes from using neurostimulation uh, in your work at Oxford. Could you just share some of those top level findings? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, um, it, I edited the book, not wrote it completely oh. by myself. Just need to give the credits to the other uh, contributors to the book. Um, so, and, and also, mainly not in clinical settings, but also a bit in clinical settings, but mostly on healthy population. Uh, try to find out if stimulation can um, improve your performance. Now, um, how many of you thinks that, think that really stimulation going to make you smarter? Wow. <laughs> OK. How many of you think that stimulation will not make you smarter? OK, so that's a problem. You're just not raising your hand. So <laughs> be, OK. How many of you think that stimulation is going to make you smarter? Brain stimulation going to make you smarter? Come on, raise your hand or not. Just decide. Yeah. OK, L let me tell you that. Stimulation by itself will not make you smarter. Um, because it's just like that you will take a steroid and sit on the sofa and will not go to the gym, OK? Um, it just puts a bit of electricity into your head. It will not cause to permanent change, will not cause to your brain to work more efficiently and to become smarter. When it's combined with, for example, cognitive training, it can add value to the cognitive training and maybe make it that you profit from it more than just do cognitive training by itself. Just like when you will go to the gym with and without steroids, OK? Um, so that's first thing that it's important to stress. And this is coming from experimental findings. The other one is that there are no free lunches. So um, if you're going to stimulate yourself, you might find improvement and that you enhance your abilities. And this is what most of the scientific literature focus on, because we really were most intrigued if we can improve human capacity. And people were really focused on that, whether we can or not. And there is more and more evidence showing that we probably can. But people did not look if there is something that we call mental cost. So you might improve a given capacity when you focus on it and you know I'm going to stimulate this brain region, which is involved in X mental function, and it's going also to affect other brain regions as well. What might happen is that you might deteriorate in another cognitive capacity that usually you're actually not going to look at. And this is something that we try to, well, that we start to find out and shed light on that, and it is very important to pay attention to that. And this is what now some um, research is looking at, because we need to give to the audience and to the people that might use it in the future, the, a better understanding what might be the cost that they need to pay in order to improve their abilities. You can think that someone with some um, problem in cognition because of um, neurological damage or developmental origin have more motivation, has more motivation to improve their capacity um, even on the expense of another mental capacity, okay? If you cannot speak because you been through stroke, you might be willing to sacrifice to some degree another cognitive capacity. But this might not be the case if you're a healthy adult, and it might be the case, but we need to know that. The other thing is that 
in the Western society, we have a lot of ideals like um, all men and women are, are created equal. But the brain is not. And some people will benefit from stimulation because of how the brain is, is basically how that is, their brain is working. Other might not benefit. And some might even show impairment when they use the same stimulation that benefited others. And we can now predict it also based on individual traits and based on physiological uh, markers. So this is something that we are going forward because it is important to people to understand that whether they are going to benefit from that or not. Um, at the moment, most of the studies have been done on a small population, on very homogeneous populations, which are usually university students. If people are going to try it at home, they might not fit to the profile of people that, you basically, that we basically uh, base our evidence on. So it is important to um, have the understanding of that. Uh, just one last thing. I know I've been given five minutes. I'm sorry. Um, there are devices that have been sold to public nowadays. Um, and some of them um, might be based on um, scientific findings. However, to the best of my knowledge, uh, no one tested what happened when people been stimulated on a daily basis for months. Okay, we don't know the safety of that. Most of the studies been done one time on a given individuals, or maybe five to ten times. But people do not understand that when they're taking the device at home, they stimulate on a daily basis for months, there might be consequences that we never actually examined. So um, it's something that it's important to stress. And I know we're going to talk about that specifically later in the panel, looking at devices like Think and, and Focus. But I want to come to Christine and talk to you about the work you're doing at the, uh, the Human Brain Project, but specifically um, when we spoke on the phone, you mentioned that we're calling these non-invasive devices, but you have a concern with calling these uh, direct current or uh, cognitive uh, enhancers uh, non-invasive. And I just wondered if you could that, share that with us. Yes. Okay. So um, um, on this panel, I'm not at all a scientist. Uh, actually, I'm a historian. And so, yes, um, uh, what I do for a living is try to ask questions that um, nobody else is asking. Because the historians always try to sort of step back and look at the broader picture and on a longer period of time. So that's why I've been recruited uh, to take part in this big European project called the, U the Human Brain Project, which is a big neuroscience project. And, um, and I bring to it, I'm contributing to doing some foresight, trying to see where some of the things we are developing in the project, where it's going in the future, based on things that I can see coming from the past. And in relation to um, uh, all those uh, neurostimulation devices and neuroenhancement things, what this kind of historian view uh, I have brings me to asking, and I just, I'm going to mention that I, I love asking a lot of questions. Uh, historians never answer questions. We just open more questions that you already have. So that's how we work. Um, some of the questions that come to me in relation to these devices is first to see, okay, uh, the current metaphor for the brain is uh, that it's this kind of information processing device and that mostly it works by circulating current around. What historians know is that throughout history, um, for a long, long time, whenever there was some big technological development, they were used as metaphors for the brain. That was the case with the steam machine at the time of the Industrial Revolution. It's always changing. So currently, it's the computer. It doesn't mean it's a kind of uh, the right uh, metaphor or that it's the truth. So um, some of the questions I can ask around these devices, like uh, Luke said, is, for instance, questioning the discourse around neuroenhancement. So where do we draw a line between what is invasive and what is non-invasive? Uh, it can be very handy for um, a lot of, uh, 
uh, uh, let's say, market forces to have some devices classified as non-invasive and others classified as invasive. But when you look at the science that is going on in these particular technologies, I mean, is really a current going through, through your brain less invasive than implanting an electrode, in, in a, an electrode in your brain? These are all questions we need to ask. One is physical, the other is a wave. It doesn't mean it doesn't have long-term effects and it doesn't have I mean, it doesn't have irreversible effects, but it has a lot of implication for the kind of regulation uh, that it falls under. So, yes, so uh, why these sort of absolute categories between invasive and non-invasive? Um, other questions you may ask is around this discourse around neuroenhancement uh, is, well, it's presented as neuroenhancement, neurostimulation, and these are sort of very positive connotations around these terms. What if you call it neurointervention and neurocontrol devices? That's what they could do as well. Uh, this is far less positive. But um, in terms of marketing, it's also much less effective. Um, but it's also very leading, because when you talk neuroenhancement and neurostimulation, you are going to think about specific applications and not others, like neurocontrol, for instance, or neurointervention. Um, other things that I may think about around asking questions is where do these devices fit? Um, and why is it so useful currently to use the brain, uh, the, the metaphor of the computer for the brain? And if you read, if you start looking at all that's going on in computer science and computer technology, you will find that um, a lot of people are interested in getting human and machines ever more integrated and are currently looking, you know, the, the most uh, investment in research and development is aimed at lifting some bottlenecks around, you know, performance, raising performance ever more, lowering energy consum consumptions, and another major bottleneck that people are trying to remove is the interface between the computer and the, the machine and the human. So if you can actually interface directly to the brain, instead of having to go through the visual systems or the, the hands, or, uh, it's actually, it can actually be much quicker. And if you look at uh, these big systems where humans are integrated with machines, well, uh, these neuroenhancements and neurostimulation devices it could actually become very interesting interfaces to make the human this kind of uh, just a cog in the machine. Um, one last sort of question I would like to raise is that in the metaphor of uh, the computer for the brain and this kind of the brain is, this, uh, is just this information processing device that circulates currents, this is taking inspiration from the brain to devise new technologies uh, and new um, information processing technologies in a very specific way. But for instance, why don't we fund research to take inspiration from the brain? Because the brain is not only efficient in terms of energy consumption or massively efficient in terms of performance, but is also biodegradable and as such recyclable. And in our world where we are very worried about where the planet is going, um, that may be actually a good inspiration to make you know, um, computers that are biodegradable. Uh, but that's not the kind of research that's being funded. So um, okay, that's a few of the more open questions I want to raise around these already <laughs> large issues. So the brain is recyclable. And I think <laughs> we're going to come back to, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's the bottle bank and then there's the brain bank and then there's the, the old clothing bank. It's, it's, that piece around language is something that I would love to come back to later in the panel because I think that's very important for how we're contextualizing this entire debate because it, they are still electro devices. They're still these kind of um, tangible, uh, mechanic, electronic things, and are we are we getting caught on that? But I want to, before that, I want to go to uh, Luciana Hale. 
Did I get that right? <laughs> Every time it's Luciano Lucian. Um, Very I know. <laughs> and I've been trying to be on a panel with you since uh, we both joined the um, Institute for Unnecessary Research run by Anna Dimitriou. Uh, most wonderful little arts collective, um, well not little anymore, <laughs> 40, <laughs> 40 of them. 40 um, and I think the way of getting in is you go for a drink with Anna, I'm not entirely sure how that, that uh, plays out. But, but you're, at the moment you're artist in residence at the University um, of Sussex in the Department of Informatics. And the reason I was so desperate to have you on this panel specifically is because we're talking about um, enhancements and we're talking about uh, making cognitively better, almost with value judgment. But some of your works looked at exploring some, using these technologies to create new sorts of difference, specifically around using these sort of devices to induce lucid dreaming. Is it? Yes, <laughs> that's been one of my main artistic endeavors since 2007. Uh, I was luckily funded by the Arts Council to initiate a project titled Cyber Sleep, where I traveled to a retreat to study the techniques of lucid dreaming uh, under the uh, scientist, neuroscientist Stephen LaBerge, who was the first neuroscientist to bring lucid dreaming into, uh, actually prove it in the sleep laboratory. So what I'd like to do is, like to establish, everybody knows, I would like to clarify, do you all know what a lucid dream is? Could you put your hands up? if you realize you've had a lucid dream. Given the lights in here, I feel like I'm having one right now. <laughs> That's quite a good response. Uh, we could be having one now. So how do we know we are? Because there is a scientific, uh, you know, a statistical test you do in the, the interviews that follow any sleep laboratory analysis. Uh, it's called the lucid test. And um, what scores most highly are details to do, to do with um, well, obviously, details to do with the, the visuals, but um, you've got to have disassociation. So you're kind of aware it was you, but somehow it wasn't you. Then there are, there's insight. So you kind of know what's coming next. And you feel, the third one is, an element of control. And you are able to demonstrate the element of control because you've become aware within the dream. So what you're actually ex experiencing are primary and secondary states of consciousness within this semi, well, it's sleeping because you're exhibiting total muscle atonia. So what I've done with my artwork is uh, comparatively with the sleep laboratory, sleep laboratories, muscle atonia, sleep paralysis. So any of you that have ever woken up in a dream, uh, sorry, woken up and it felt paralyzed, that's just a certain stage of sleep. Obviously, it's really freaky and it's unusual and it might inspire you to make music or art, but um, that's not what my work's about. My work is about when you're, it begins with the REM stage. So when your eyes are moving fastly and you may see that with your partner or you've seen that in films, um, from that stage, then there's an even higher level where you are, you're conscious of the fact that you're, you're dreaming. And my, my work explores that. So I connect people to an EEG machine now, clearly, I can't get people to go to sleep within a, an installation. Well, not yet, not unless I'm funded for something really big and time-based that can go on for a few months. So I tend to have 20-minute sessions with each participant in my work, enough time to allow them to relax deeply in a, in a dentist chair I currently use. And uh, I use different techniques of induction, hypnosis, the dream machine, the Brian Geissen uh, flickering ph ph uh, photic stimulation that lulls you into an alpha and theta state, taking your brain waves deeper. And at the same time, I'm measuring these brain waves and projecting them for everyone else to see. Now, along these years of doing this, and I must say, I just said to Christine earlier, I've been doing this about 23 years. <laughs> um, I have seen technology come and go, and all this time, person just helmet was available, the Roshti, the Shakti, these strange ways of stimulating the brain. At the same time, I've been using the EEG to look at the brain artistically. There was this other school of uh, creatives actually stimulating the brain, which I didn't directly do. But in 2012, I was employed, because as an artist, you always need other income streams, as a therapist in quantitative EEG in a center in London called Brainworks Neurotherapy. Um, if any of you have ever had neurofeedback treatment, it's more likely you're in Germany or you're an American citizen because it's included in your health care plan there. In this country, it's very expensive and it's private. And most of the um, 
clients that came to us uh, had autism, Asperger's, and ADHD. <coughs> so we were looking at maps of the brainwave. I would take a reading of many regions. Uh, my boss would then give me a symptom checklist of all of this, also following a verbal interview of many hours with each um, uh, patient then I would work with them and eventually we employed this new technique of neurofield which is actually a combination of neurostim with quantitative EEG. So we would begin with a process called the dehabituator and that was kind of like shuffling your brain waves. So the dehabituator we used four low power coils as low intensity yeah. as what you will be talking about in a moment Andrew and they could be positioned anywhere on the head, which was interesting about them. So you would wear a cap with Velcro, and depending on uh, whether it was the sensory motor region across the hairline, or frontals or temporals, I would just apply these four match, if you know what a matchbox size is, it's a bit redundant now, uh, coils onto the brain, and then run these routines. All the software uh, completely calibrated the protocols differently for each uh, patient. And that was a dehabituator. Then we would run the neurofeedback, where we would use EEG and rewards with um, interactive visuals. And then at the end of the session, we would finish with that, with that patient, if they were suitable, with um, a protocol. There was about 100 designed in this, in this software package. So it was a combination of neurofield and neurostim, neuroguide working together. And um, it's an American package, but I used that for two years. And most of the time, uh, this was for the, the children who had a problem with coming up. So they were either so medicated, they were deeply in theta. So we were trying to stim them electrically with the tiny coils to increase the voltage around the frontals and the temporals. And over weekly sessions, we're not talking about daily, we're not talking about at home. This was a, in a clinic in London. They would have a weekly session. Some would come twice weekly and they could use this. So I got more insight into the kind of uh, efficacy of this kind of technologies during 2012, 2014, through um, that commercial um, and therapeutic outlet. In terms of the efficacy of these technologies and exploring them firsthand, uh, when we were curating this, this panel, and Maria and I were, were desperate to have Andrew join us and a uh, brain hacker join us someone who's experimenting with these devices um, almost uh, not even weekly I think almost daily if I'm if I'm correct and Andrew the thing I want to ask you about specifically is your approach to self-experimentation you are your own laboratory if that's fair for me to say yes I do and I just want to wonder one sort of why do you take this, such a proactionary approach to exploring these devices? And secondly, if you could share the story of how you're getting access to some of these devices as well, because I know that's a, so you have access to some kit that doesn't feature often in this country. Oh, that's right. <laughs> well, it's a long story, but I'll try to cut it short. About a quarter of a century, I used to participate in uh, design of nootropic drugs. Uh, I had a drug uh, on my own, which I've proposed, unfortunately, for uh, geopolitical reasons. It didn't go any further than the initial uh, animal trials, even though I have to say my uh, rats and mice did remarkably fine on that. So, so an interesting thing about it is by uh, my degree, I'm actually a pharmacologist, toxicologist, so I came from the drug side. And then again, my thesis was actually on uh, mechanisms of brain death to summarize it so I looked at the uh, unsafe uh, side uh, of the fence at things that uh, if you are familiar with neuroscience like excited toxicity but at the same time when I did it all uh, there were other reasons uh, but the main reason is the general attitude uh, towards enhancement, uh, I could not get any decent postdoc and I went private. So just doing research in order to get a postdoc and wear a white lab coat, uh, that's a bit of a strange uh, approach for myself. You know, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather do it in my spare time, but I do what I like to do, I do what I want to do and what I'm interested in. So of course, uh, at that time I didn't know much 
uh, I'm talking about uh, year around 2004, 2005. I didn't know much about uh, biophysical stimulation means. All I was wondering about is, is there actually a way to recreate nootropic effects without the need to have a chemical lab, synthesize a drug, and on and on and on, effectively without the need of having your own pharmaceutical uh, company, which uh, I can't afford since my father's name is not Bill Gates. So uh, I started looking at various, uh, and I'm not only talking about uh, electrostimulation, I'm talking about uh, a variety of modalities, and in effect I can stimulate across the whole uh, electromagnetic spectrum, spare for X-rays and gamma, of course. There are still some holes in the spectrum where I can't get. Uh, that would be corrected quite soon. Uh, then I can also use uh, ultrasound, 44 kilo, uh, would be able to use 880 kilo quite soon. Uh, infrasound is quite easy to generate. So, but I think partially the topic of this talk is deceiving because people think about devices in the best case, uh, modalities, something I've been talking about, whether you know, we're using uh, a coherent light or whether we're using uh, a direct current or anything else. But in reality, uh, it should be about stimulation protocols and mechanisms they uh, actually target very specific mechanisms and how to get there. And that's my primary interest. And if you think about uh, more on the ground issues uh, which I'm trying to solve and I could be mistaken of course but I think solved at least partially. Uh, there are two major issues. One is targeting a specific area at depth. So for instance you want to target a specific area of the brain which is not on the surface but uh, let's say it's a basal nucleus and it's let's say three centimeters below the surface, etc. Uh, and the second issue which is not resolved is to target a very specific uh, molecular mechanism. Uh, that's where the drug side comes in. You know, what's great about drugs is that you can have a specific agonist or antagonist or inverse agonist, whatever partial agonist for a specific receptor subtype or those days even a splice form and you know how it works you know what it induces, at least in uh, relation to that uh, specific mechanism. But uh, this is not the level at which uh, current neurostimulation uh, protocols work. That's the level where I want them to work. So how far have you, how far have you got? I mean, what is it you're playing with right now? What, is, what are some of the self-experiments you're, you're doing? Well, I, I, I actually went, I would say, quite far as far as possible in terms of garage science setting. Of course, it's not something I can publish in Nature. Uh, of course, uh, you know, it's quite easy to say that, oh, you know, you should dismiss it all because there is no proper double-blind randomized trial and so forth. Now, my usual response to that, A, uh, someone has got to make the first step. Even if I'm wrong, even if I'm mistaken, you know, Columbus was mistaken. He thought it's America, it was Cuba. Uh, nevertheless, we still remember him. So, so where's Cuba in the brain? Like, what have you, what have you hit? What's the, if, if that's a fair question to ask. Are, are you finding, are you going in with, a, with an assumption of the sort of outcome you going in, for want of a better word? Are you going in with an um, assumption of the sort of outcome you want, or are you well, well, just that's all, allowing well, these that's all, to... Well, there are two problems uh, I've mentioned. One problem is stimulating a very specific area at depth without even perhaps affecting the surface. And another problem, which is uh, stimulating a very specific biochemical mechanism and not just generally making neurons more or less excited. Now, I always viewed them as a single problem. And that's why I think I've got a solution for it. So this is a very bold claim, but I think I can target a very specific mechanism at a given depth. And Andrew, we're going to come back to you because I know you've got toys as well. Thank and you. 
I hope. <laughs> Just a few. There was a big suitcase. And, uh, and if anybody wants to um, volunteer. Uh, Andrew, what I think you're doing is, is so important in terms of how we are trying to look at technologies, whether they're sex robots or cyberdelics or it's, it's neurostimulation. We're trying to take these technologies on their own, on their own accord. So we're trying to take them as, as a given. I think what you're doing in terms of self-experimentation uh, allows us to see some of the effects. But Nick, what would you like to see in terms of not just qualitative feedback from an individual like uh, uh, Andrew, um, but from anyone who is self-experimenting right now with these devices or, or being a brain hacker or trying this in their, their garage, do you have any specific concerns yeah, or are you supportive of this kind of? I, I, I'd like to think I'm a, a libertarian in the sense that I, I've, I'm perfectly happy that if you take an informed decision to do something to yourself, then you're, you're very welcome to do that. As long as it doesn't harm everyone else, you know, that's fine. Um, and there's a long history of self-experimentation in science and medicine that has led to really ex important discoveries. For example, the discovery that um, Helicobacter pylori, uh, it's a bacterium, is one of the leading causes of uh, stomach ulcers, was discovered through self-experimentation. So, you know, this is important. We need to know about this stuff. But we need those, that information to feed into a scientific mechanism as well. So uh, I, I don't want to speak for Roy, but, but when Roy and I do work in our labs, we don't take a single person, we don't take ourselves, we, we take a whole cohort of, of people, uh, undergraduates mostly we acknowledge, uh, and we give half of them one protocol and we give half of them effectively a placebo and we're looking for a difference. But uh, I, we, I guess, believe that we only believe our results if there's a really significant difference between the cohort that gets the real stuff and the cohort that gets the placebo. And I think uh, I'm, I, I'm totally not against self-experimentation, but I, that, that self-experimentation needs to feed into the scientific literature exactly. as well. Well, uh, to respond to it, you know, my usual answer to, oh, but uh, you didn't run a proper clinical trial is please fund it and I will do <laughs> so. And uh, hence, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see uh, David Wood here. You know, the, the, the major problem, uh, I think, in the West at the moment is uh, you cannot get funding for enhancement. So those days, people try to go around and uh, either, you know, try to do it privately, or people even invent diseases to treat in order to get their funding. So, no, I'm, quite, I'm quite serious. I can give you a few examples. So, so, but, to keep focused, but to keep focused on these devices uh, specifically, I, I just wonder, one thing that Nick said about how informed can we be? Roy, how informed can we be that there's no kind of long-term side effects that we just haven't seen? Is there any way of testing that in a clinical uh, or academic environment on undergrads? <laughs> It's a good question. Um, I think it's a question first that the researcher needs to ask if he would be willing to participate to put his brain in such an experiment before it's doing that to others. I would not stimulate my brain for three months on a daily basis. I just have to say. So let me ask him why. Yeah, you? because I think that there might be um, negative consequences. I still don't know the side effect that might be after you know long term of stimulation and therefore I would not take any undergraduate or volunteer and you know run this experiment in order to find and you know to satisfy the curiosity and inform the world if I think that it might be dangerous. Others might do that you know researchers are different levels of decisions and ethics it's, it's very defined. Uh, that's one thing, and, and I think it's, it's very important, I, I understand your frustration. I don't think that every research principle needs to be a clinical trial. Uh, I never run a clinical trial yeah. so far, you know, and you can even start at the beginning by maybe get, you know, few people and show that you have something there and go and try to get funding from small, but the, small funding body, but this is a very important step to really establish what you have, because just to come and say, 
you know, I one person and I found results. You know, the only incident that we have in our lab that someone fainted in an experiment was actually someone who was in the placebo condition. <laughs> and placebo is very strong, has very strong effect. When people think that they're going to receive stimulation, you know, they, they're going through a lot of psychological changes in this stage, and we need to know that. The other thing is the issue of sample size, and to draw from that conclusions about safety is also dangerous. Did anyone hear about Munitz? Yeah. Yes, okay, not many. Munitz received a Nobel Prize because he found a way to treat people that had um, um, a, a, a certain medical condition. We're not going through that. And what that he basically did, it, it, it was based on few apes that he was able to do lobotomy very fast by putting a wire beneath the eyebrow and just, you know, disconnect the prefrontal cortex. And it's been run on thousands of people uh, as a way of curing people with this mental condition. And it's actually caused people a lot of psychological uh, <coughs> problems eventually. And, um, you know, it was a bad science in this case. So we need to be really careful before intervening with the brain and say, well, you know, we have good intentions, but we need to really have good evidence, strong evidence, before going and do that uh, for whatever purpose. Is, is the issue, as we stand right now with these devices, is that there's so many unknown sort of unknowns? There's so many assumptions about what these devices might do. There's so many promises about what these devices might do. And it was something I was discussing with, with Imre was, Back to Christine's point around invasive and non-invasive, if you talk to someone uh, in a very, very strong way or you upset someone, that has changes in the brain. The fact that the placebo candidate was the one who fainted, there was obviously a, some sort of change in their brain, purely non-technological, purely mediated by language in that case. Mm -hmm. That is a change in its own right, am I... Right. Yeah, and, and you see that people will show effect when they are usually in a, in a, in a sham or placebo condition. It's, this is why you need to do that. Uh, if you ask people, do you think that, you know, we were in a study on children with learning difficulties, yeah, with mathematical learning difficulties in order to try to improve their learning problem. And this was based on, you know, um, many experiments that we run first on adults. And when you ask the children, first of all, they were all fine. But when you ask the children after the cognitive training with or without stimulation, did you think that, sim that the hat that you put helped you? Even those who were in the placebo condition said, yes, it helped me. You know, it's, it's something that most of you will say. So we need to take this into account. I don't say that you don't have any uh, revolutionary I, I can't, findings. I can't, but I can't do double blind. I can obviously do single blind. Because you always Again, assume that there's an effect, is that right? No, 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 because I obviously cannot blind myself. So the only thing I can do is to uh, not to tell volunteer whether it is a sham or not sham. So in this sense, in garage science settings, of course, there is a big setback because even if we try to be logical and skeptical and so on consciously, of course, emotions do play the role. And if you are very interested in a certain theory, you would even subconsciously want to prove the theory is correct. So that's the major problem. But of course, uh, there are ways of uh, uh, bypassing it by delegating it to someone else and so on. So it's not entirely impossible. It's just impossible in garage science settings to uh, have sufficient uh, number of test subjects, of course. Because you can have 10 volunteers, you can have 12 volunteers, but you cannot have 200 volunteers. You know, saying that, there are possibilities uh, that uh, I'm exploring, uh, which is another topic. Uh, you know, you can do quite a lot of things abroad. But uh, the thing to come back uh, from where I've started, the large problem as I see it, and as pretty much, that's why I've you know, pointed to David, as pretty much every transhumanist in the UK see it, is that you can't get anything for enhancement. You know, so you can't get funding for something that is not there to treat a specific disease. But you can get funding for lucid dreaming. 
Well, uh, this looks at through post-traumatic stress disorder, so that's exactly. a very fundable, exactly. admirable kind of uh, outcome. Um, what I was looking at. So what I wonder with with regards to the work you've done with lucid dreaming, if there's also that effect of placebo, if you're telling people that you're putting them into a certain state with these devices, I mean, the, the, the great well, thing... But there was a sham. You can't do a placebo. With the lucid dreaming experiment, I'm not sure how many of you in the room may be aware, in 2014, it was proven using a combination of transcranial alternating current stimulation during sleep, so it's subconscious, below your sensory modalities, doesn't wake you up, you would continue to sleep having had the electrical stimulation on your brain, um, the sham, uh, and six different frequencies of brain, uh, sorry, electrical stimulation were applied to the brain when this combination of gamma and theta activity was detected. So the most dominant frequency was 40 hertz. When 40, when the brain, the sleeping brain exhibited REM, so your eyes are engaged in a, in a dream, not lucid, you've got total muscle atonia, so you're definitely asleep and then 40 hertz was applied to the F's and the T's, so T3, F3, and to the F2, uh, and uh, anyway, so to each side, frontals and temporals. Not waking you up for just 30 seconds after three minutes of uninterrupted REM sleep. Then you're woken up and you have to be immediately interviewed. Then the lucid scientific analysis was conducted to see if the dream quality went beyond just interesting and vivid, and very vivid, and actually quanti you know, qualified to be lucid, i.e. you're disassociated, you've got insight, and you've got element of control going on. 70% within the 40 hertz stimulation exhibited LD, so proper lucid dreaming, and these were all naive subjects, so they recruited, recruited 26 subjects. It's not a big study. Yeah. Mm. This was in Frankfurt University in the Goethe Institute mm. of Psychology, conducted by Ursula Voss. So, not a big, yeah. you know, fantastically, luckily, yeah. not a big user group. And uh, all of these people have obviously been screened for all other kind of no, um, no central nervous system medication, no prior sleep, uh, you know, disturbances, and you know, they, they'd been symptom checklists have been also done using. Mm you know, various uh, clinical guides, so. so. So it almost feels as if... It's ready for a product, but that was not done for commercial reasons. That was done purely for, you know... Well, Focus is claiming to do it, this but is, of course... Uh, this is what I w would like to, yeah. to kind of you pull know, us you into. You know almost. what the problem is. So the, the issue of these commercial devices, so it feels like the jury's still out in terms of the scientific community around the question of what these devices are doing. Is placebo just as powerful as these devices? But to to kind of bring this back to what's kind of in our hands today, what we can buy off the internet with regards to uh, think and, and, and focus. Um, Christine, I want to ask you and, if, um, and whether the, uh, the Brain Project's done any work on looking at the sort of commercial devices that are available. And to, to give kind of context to think and focus, think is a, um, is a device out of uh, California that basically uh, advertises and it's questionable whether it's actually brain stimulation. It um, advertises increased uh, wellness and well-being, and focus is marketed very, very specifically at uh, gamers and at people who want to improve their their learning. So I, I wonder, Christine, how the the Human Brain Project is looking at some of the commercial players in this space that are available to literally any member of our audience. The answer is simple: they are not. <laughs> the Human Brain Project is not looking at the commercial products currently available. They are more looking at how to innovate new products themselves that could bring IP to the project and um, go into patenting and licensing rather than experimenting what is already on the market. So I would say in, they are, and they are not, um, I mean, a, a main, for instance, we were talking the difference between invasive, non-invasive. Uh, if anything, the Human Brain Project is going to go for invasive because a big part of the project is actually developing neuromorphic computing, n uh, neuromorphic chips. And uh, if they manage to get them as small and energy efficient as they are ma aiming them to be, this is going to be very hot into neural prosthetics and brain-machine interface. So, and so that's about you know, having directly 
um, well, a microchip uh, somewhere uh, connected to uh, a part of your brain, which is then going to um, connect through wires or wireless to other parts. And, um, and uh, for instance, if you are missing a limb, it's going to, uh, for instance, give you another arm that is working and give you sensation. Or if you, your, um, uh, your, uh, your back has got, you know, you, you are sort of paraplegic or tetraplegic, you could uh, bypass actually uh, the area where your spine cord is severed and um, get some chips implanted below and in the brain it's just like and uh, get able to walk again or something like that. You could also imagine to get a third arm implanted uh, in which case it becomes enhancement uh, although a different kind. Um, yeah so that's the kind of I would say um, enhancement or uh, interven interventionist or therapeutic, I don't know how to call them, well, the, the but very, 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 very invasive. Very extreme invasive examples of yeah. what may be possible, but with regards to what's available to any of us today, Nick, I know you have strong opinions about some of the, or maybe weak opinions, uh, about some of these devices that are commercially available and some of the promises that they're, that they're making. Is, is there a miscommunication somewhere? Uh, uh, firstly, I think there is miscommunication in the sense that I think there are some claims that are being made for the devices that you can buy from the internet or maybe in stores that I don't believe are supported in the science literature. But also, uh, I think there's a, there's a grey area in how these devices are marketed. So if a device, if Focus, which uh, it, it does use TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation, if that device claimed to treat a disorder. So if it said, if you put these on, you will not have a headache anymore. Or if you put this on, you'll no longer have ADHD. Then that becomes a medical device. And there's a, ma there's a big structure for regulating the marketing of medical devices. They're not doing that. What they're claiming is that they can enhance your otherwise normal abilities. They can make you more, um, I think I'm right, they make you more focused during computer gaming. That kind of claim about a cognitive enhancement, which is not a medical enhancement, doesn't fall under any uh, l um, directive of the European Union currently. So they're exploiting a, a grey area, which might be perfectly fine. They might be very welcome to do that, but that's how they're allowed to market this sort of device. Roy, do you think those, I mean, should those sort of devices be medically regulated? I'm not sure if you've use the think or use the, the, the focus, but with regards to some of the promises they're making, I mean even think there's an assumption that it's manipulating the brain, but in actual fact it's, it's not, it's peripheral, peripheral nerves. And does that sort of affect how the public perceives maybe perhaps your work and how you're uh, trying to um, uh, develop your devices? Is there, is there a, a assumption and a hope that can't be realized through these devices? Well, um, I, I would not put all the companies in one box because mm -hmm. some of them really do experiments and try to base their evidence, their uh, claims on evidence that coming, some just making a very easy way, just citing some scientific studies and selling their um, devices in what I would say is a misleading way because no one actually run any experiments with these devices, with these parameters, with this context that they try to claim. Um, but I think that um, all of them did not examine the effect of stimulation for a long period. They just uh, did for one session and sell it, for example, to an audience that would use it more than once. That's one thing. The other thing is that I think there is a, um, a view that is no longer valid that the um, um, FDA, which is in the US, regulates um, um, devices, for example, de depends what type of drugs, um, has. And it is that where they're, they're interested in safety and efficacy. And they want to see a group effect. So one group receives stimulation, another receives placebo, and there is an effect. It's working, it's safe. 
send it, send it to the public in this case, that this will be, I think, their approach. Um, and nowadays, all the field of uh, medicine, for example, and psychology and neuroscience is moving into looking how different individuals will react to treatment. And when we're coming to healthy individuals, we really need to know which individuals are going to be in the risk of receiving such stimulation or uh, intervention to their brain. Um, and I think that this is a neglected point because you have a lot to lose if you know if you the unlucky people that are going to be stimulated. Um, and we find that some of the people that we give them stimulation, you know, show impairments rather than enhancement. Uh, I think when people putting the money wants to improve their abilities and eventually going to impair that, they will not, I don't know if they will know or notice this thing, but I think it is an important thing to know. So how do we, um, how do we get more information on our own brains? By yourself, you mean? But right now, what, what is it? What is it? Do we go to the Human Brain Project? Do we knock on Nick's door at Manchester Met? Do we? Do you come yeah, and well, you in Oxford? First, or first, do we yeah. hang out first with Andrew? All, so, so first of all, start dreaming uh, with I, Lucy. Like, how do we? First of all, I would not say who to go to, but um, we all, uh, based, you know, we all need to be grateful to people who come, and volunteer in our experiment. So if you can volunteer in experiments, of course, and you think it's justified come and do that. That's the, the first thing. Um, then the other thing is that also, you know, be a bit skeptics and it is important to be skeptics, to run and start to stimulate your brain because some people find findings. It is exciting, but we need to be a bit patient. And I think there's going to be a level that we need to go forward. Uh, I don't think that's the stage at the moment. You know, I'm not stimulating my brain to enhance my abilities. And, you know, we're running a lot of experiments. Um, I'm not doing that. Um, and if I'm not doing that, you know, there is a good reason. Uh, I would, of course, want to be much smarter. Uh, I'm working hard at the moment. I hope that I'm making any progress, but uh, yeah. yeah. That's what every Oxford professor says. That's, uh, that's <laughs> but I, so this idea of volu volunteering and volunteering yourself, I kind of want to, there'll be a sign-up sheet at the end of the, end of the event if anybody's interested. Or, and I don't know, Andrew, I, I saw you set, it's a lot of wires, and I saw you set this this up. Are you able to show us anything either on yourself or on? Well, yes, I can, of course, if if there if there is a. Well, need. could you give us could you give us a, a tangible example of perhaps one of these devices? I'm not sure if that's one device or if that's six, but is there is there a tangible well, piece? Well, I, I, I've could... brought various commercially available devices because you know we are talking about them, so uh, it's maybe good for people, if not to use them, but at least have a look at what they look like and what are they about. I've brought my uh, own device, uh, which, is, which is there on the table uh, in the middle, those two strange, yeah, the strange two shower uh, looking things. It's not particularly cute. I don't have a name for it. Perhaps I should call it Bob, uh, but. Well, it, could you explain what Bob, who lives in Cuba, does to, to, to you and your... Well, as I've said, it's not about the device, it's about the stimulation protocol. Right, okay. So, uh, one of the things which would actually enhance safety quite a lot, apart from uh, providing far more data to ponder over, is the problem with commercial devices is those days, apart from Star Steam, which is not a, an end user device, it's a stimulator and uh, at the same time an encephalographer used in academia, it costs about 10K, so it's not very likely uh, you're going to buy it unless you're really interested and is quite, quite well off. Uh, they will also not sell it, I have to say, to the public. They probably will. I mean, it takes 100 quid to register an LTD, doesn't it? Pardon? It takes 100 quid to register an LTD. I think you need to provide further documents, but okay, okay fine. Maybe. Just, uh, yes. So the problem with those end user devices is they do not allow any measurement. While me and our group at Hackspace and so on always looked at having a full loop, having a full feedback loop. So you measure, you measure simultaneously, you provide feedback, and let's say in the neurofeedback type of setting, you know, when you need uh, someone to get into a specific state, 
uh, in encephalographic terms, you know, you use your, first you can use neurofeedback to get the Y stimulate if you can get it on your own. Unfortunately, and I'm quite sure uh, Luciana would agree, about 30% of people do not respond to neurofeedback. And, uh, and, hypnosis. And, 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 and then the question is, what, what do you do with them? So you can bring them to the desired state via your specific... Uh, so it's hard to read whilst you're stimming when you're measuring from the yeah. same 10, 20 electro positions. You've got to filter off the very same signals yeah, yeah. that you're providing. But that's, that could be sorted out via d using different modalities and different yeah. measurement ways and so on. So you can use f nears to measure and you can use your uh, uh, AC. Or what we did at the last brain hackathon, you can simply put... Uh, a high pass filter and then you can use your DC with uh, your EEG without any problems and it, and you can actually use uh, you can create a full stimulation measurement uh, uh, loop uh, using a Raspberry Pi which is what we did and then you can control it over SSH remotely which is fun uh, so uh, so with this notion of duration being such a, Roy, you were concerned that you wouldn't use something every single day for a long period of time. Andrew, is there anything here that you are using durationally and have been using for a long period of time and, and seeing outcomes for yourself? Uh, well, I would actually go for something uh, which I'm interested in to see whether there is a result both on myself and on volunteers, uh, then if I see that result, I would probably use it when I need that specific result. Because that's something what Roy was talking about. It's not about generally becoming smarter, and that's why I didn't put my hand up uh, on his first question. It's about enhancing a specific ability, perhaps, at the cost of another ability which you have, have to then uh, take into account and you may not accept it or you may say if in you know very uh, sort of non-scientific example if if you're a musician you may not want to be that keen on uh, a protocol that decreases your musical ability but increases your ability in math but if you're a mathematician it would be quite the opposite now this is not a real uh, world example, I've just made it up. So you may personally take that decision, uh, but generally I can't actually recall any significant uh, side effects per for one case which is discussable on myself. On volunteers, I had one volunteer who actually fainted and that was very interesting and that uh, again is discussable in a more sort of academic uh, circles. Uh, so I would not actually do it day after day after day after day after day. I would see whether there is an effect. So I would have, for instance, uh, N equals, I don't know, 9 or 10 on myself. And then when I need that effect, then I would use it. So for instance, you know, what's the point right now to use a protocol which would make me uh, more awake, uh, more alert, Etc. I'm fine. Well, right now you're speaking on I'm a panel, fine. so that would have been a really good thing to. <laughs> right, but if you had uh, your 14 hours flight, and you have to be in the office and do something quite intense, uh, three four hours after you land, and you didn't really sleep, yeah, I will go for it. But and can we today drill down in that way? Are we able to to understand? For you personally, have you been able to use that example for a flight um, to, increase uh, to increase your awareness and, or decrease it in some cases? Are, are any of these pieces of tech that you, you've brought with you today, do they do those sort of things? Do you yeah, have yeah. the awareness, the personal the yeah, of of self-awareness of, of what your brain is doing? Of course they do, but as I've said, it does not really depend on the specific piece of tech. Sometimes it doesn't even depend on the modality. It may depend on... Uh, you know, what area do you target and what kind of stimulation uh, protocol? But for you, for you personally, use. Andrew, is there anything that's, that's working for you right now? Is there something where you're like, this is a device I'm going to wear durationally or use durationally? No, because I adjust it to tasks. 
okay. you know, this is one thing. And another thing is when we talk about uh, enhancement, and one thing I was uh, continuously going on, you can't, fund, you can't get funding about enhancement because it doesn't treat any disease. There is practically no border between enhancement and prevention. And this means you can't get funding for preventive medicine. And quite often, what I'm talking about is not really enhancement, but adaptation. And something I did ages ago uh, at one of the Futurist talks, you know, uh, I'm not sure how many people are here, but uh, please, everyone, rise up their hand. Just uh, everyone, oh. everyone, 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 everyone. Now, if you think that you are stressed and overworked, put it down. If you have a sleep problem, put it down. If you have depression problem, any mild depression, feeling low, put it down. If you have an addiction, put it down. If you think you're neurotic, put it down. So you see how many hands do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine, ten. If you're a what, compulsive what, what, what liar, be, put what it. Would be, yeah. What would be the what would be the percentage of people who are perfectly fine and don't have anything that could be defined as a borderline disorder? So, before we start talking about enhancement, you know, we should start talking about adaptation. And we are not living in the environment we can easily adapt to. You know, just think about. Uh, how life was different only 100 years ago, absolutely nothing in evolutionary terms. So quite a lot of it is about that, and it's also about prevention. If, for example, uh, I think by the year 2020, I can't remember this uh, uh, WHO report, depression would be reason number one for disability. So maybe we're treating it too late. Maybe it's possible to detect uh, the signs of upcoming depression where you look at brainwave states, when you look at fMRI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and prevent it. And perfect means of prevention in this case could well be bringing that back to normal, which is much easier to do with biophysical methods than with drugs. Something I actually wanted to ask you, just a little question, working with the um, neurostims, but using the, the coils on like the guts, on the vagus yeah. nerve, to stimulate the enteric nervous system mm, as a way of treating depression without uh, chemical kosh. What your thoughts are on that? Well, I had this paper somewhere ages ago called uh, The Brain and Your Guts. Maybe you've seen it. And I have and to the second brain, which is a little... Yeah, well, the second brain, and this is about Meissner and our, our, well, our Bach put, plexi. put those coils on there for some of the clients when I had the yeah. uh, therapeutic job. Well, I would suspect because uh, the gut is quite important in 5-HT metabolism. Mm -hmm. Somehow it affects it. A lot it. of serotonin production, more yes. than 40% or so? Yes. But also talking about, you know, specifically uh, depression, uh, there are quite a lot of papers coming out those days saying it's a mitochondrial disorder, saying there are lots of peripheral signs, uh, including uh, platelet, erythrocyte metabolism, and so on, which are specific for it, saying there is a mitochondrial compromise of prefrontal cortex. So, uh, it, it, it's, it's a big topic. So perhaps there's an argument there that maybe just focusing on the brain in itself is just one organ, maybe the wrong approach. Now I'm very, very keen to open up to an audience who um, have been Sorry. so Sorry. kind to stand. But before, before we do that, we wanted to try something um, a little bit different for five minutes. Um, a wonderful uh, science fiction near future writer, a friend of mine, Stephen Oram, um, has kindly prepared us a short um, science fiction narrative. Um, so I met Stephen uh, through Greenbelt Festival a couple of years ago, and Stephen's been writing these beautiful little um, sort of near fu future narratives. And we just wanted to have one of these before we do audience questions, just to get the sort of <laughs> the brain stimulated for want of a uh, for want of a better. Um, term. So, okay. Steve Oren, thank you. So I think I'm the I'm the light relief, aren't I, between the uh, 
Continue. Get us out of the depression that we are. So I have to say, I've probably got about another 6,000 stories buzzing around in my head uh, after, after that. But this is one uh, that I wrote before today. And it's called Everyday Stims. So can you hear OK? Can you? Yeah. It was Monday morning. Louise had been at work for two hours, and the Neurostim headset was starting to itch. She scratched her scalp, careful not to dislodge the headset and accidentally stimulate the wrong bits of her brain. Barry, the cute one, called across. Hey, throw me a patient's token. I've got a right old moaner on the line. Already been on five minutes and still hasn't said what he wants. She rummaged around in her drawer, making sure she kept talking to her caller. You never knew when the bosses were listening in, and the last thing she could afford was to have her pay docked. She found a pink token with a large P printed on it. Could you hold for one minute, please, she said to her caller. Here you go, she threw Barry the token. You owe me. I gave you a speed stim yesterday, he called back. He pushed the token into his console and waited for the headset to stimulate. He took the phone off mute. I hear what you're saying, sir, he said into his mouthpiece. The call centre was in full swing, and the voices of 150 operatives hung over the room like a flock of chattering birds. Some of the workers stood and spoke loudly, while others hunched over their desks and whispered into their headsets. Whichever approach they took, it all added to the chaotic mix of boredom and anxiety. Her caller was busy looking for the purchase details she needed to process his claim. She looked at her tokens. Her standard prescription ones were well organised, but the extras were a mess. Her basic tokens, a prescription of neurostims that kept you calm under pressure and help with knowledge retention, were the same as everyone else's, although their dosages differed. The company also insisted on a stim that gave you an unpleasant tingle at the back of your throat if you didn't pay enough attention to the caller's question. It was the optional tokens that she struggled to keep tidy and in their packets. Partly because everyone was always swapping with each other, but also because she'd take, it, she'd take one out to help her deal with a difficult customer, and then the situation would change and she'd decide she didn't need it. Yes, sir, she said as the caller came back on the line. I'm sure you did, sir. It's just that we don't have a record of it. I realise this is frustrating, sir. You did? Oh, I see. Give me a minute to check with my supervisor. She put the caller on hold and leant back in her chair. He reckoned that he'd been promised a free upgrade, but that was impossible because it would be at least another three weeks before there were any available to her company. She checked the caller's record. As she guessed, he'd been deliberately routed through to her because some idiot had made a stupid promise. She jiggled her tokens from side to side until she found the green and white one. This delivered a stim that liberated creativity by reducing anxiety, and she'd shown a particularly positive reaction to it in her annual aptitude assessment. Her weekly prescription now included 20 for her to use whenever she wanted. She pushed it into her console and waited. It only took a few seconds before she felt the effects. She closed her eyes and breathed deeply. The answer popped into her head. Sorry to keep you waiting. I think I have a solution for you. I see you use a lot of data each month. Is that why you want to upgrade? To get a more efficient model? Yes. Good. Then I think you'll be interested in our new data efficiency app. It's normally £10 a month, but we, reduce it. we can reduce it to 5 for the first two months as a special offer. How does that sound? The caller accepted gratefully, and as soon as she disconnected, he gave her a 10 out of 10 satisfaction score. Pleased with herself, she wandered over to the drinks machine with her portable tablet and wireless headset. She took her next caller through the security questions while she purchased a can of water. When she arrived back at the desk, the supervisor was waiting. Monthly test, he said, as soon as you completed your call, please. Damn, she'd forgotten today was the day. She'd remembered at the Sunday night pub quiz and had abstained from using her black market headset. That was a relief, at least. It had been hard to resist. Those stims were great. They released knowledge you didn't even know you had. She sighed. Taking the test was irritating because it was time away from earning money. But if they got your prescription right, the boost to your performance and pay was incredible. They'd test for changes in brain activity using the previous month's baselines of intelligence and aptitude for the job. 
and then personalise her most effective daily combination of stimulations. And that would be her prescription for the month. They'd also test for any signs of non-prescribed stimulation, and if they found any at all, she'd be dismissed. She pushed a calm token into the console, the third of the day. As soon as she dealt with the caller's request for his account details, she logged off. Barry winked as she walked past him. You never know, I might get some new ones this time, she said as she ruffled his hair. In the HR department, the doctor's receptionist took her name, clicked the headgear into place and began the test. While she waited, she flicked through the company leaflet to see what new stims were being advertised. She didn't really understand what they did, but that didn't matter because the doctor always knew what was best for her. The receptionist called her name. Yes, you can go in now. She walked into the doctor's room and sat down. Miss Barclay, we seem to have a problem. Really? Yes, really. There's evidence of activity in your brain that I didn't prescribe. Care to explain? What sort of activity, she said, stalling for time. That's what I'm asking you. No lies, Miss Barclay. She'd taken a nifty little stim on Saturday night that had boosted her flirting ability. Her dealer had assured her it was untraceable. What if he was wrong? She felt the calmness from the stim wear off almost immediately. She searched her brain for any remnants of the creative green and white. Nothing. Oh, she whispered, fearing the worst. Her body sagged and a small amount of bile leaked into her mouth. She gulped it back down and coughed. The doctor tapped his fingers on the desk. Miss Barclay, since we last met, have you had any non-prescribed stimulations? Not as such. Miss Barclay, well, at the weekend there was this party and everyone was having fun, so I did have a little bit of something to help me relax. But nothing that would affect my work and nothing that's on offer here. It was a moment of weakness, I know, but nothing serious. He frowned. Use of non-prescribed stimulation is illegal. You know that, surely. She nodded. Punished by instant dismissal. You know that too, I presume? Yes. The company simply cannot employ people who indulge in neurostimulations we haven't prescribed. You are addicts and we won't be associated with you. Her breathing was rapid and shallow. The fear of what might be about to happen was running amok in every part of her body. Does this mean, she whispered. Yes, I have no choice. You are now a registered addict. You're no longer permitted performance enhancing stimulation in any job and you're dismissed from this one with immediate effect. She tensed her muscles to stand but hesitated. Please don't. This means I'll never get another job. I'll lose my home and my friends. Those are the rules, Miss Barclay. Rules you were only too aware of when you decided to boost your chances of a Saturday night fling. Was it worth it? No, of course it wasn't. You can't do this. It's a death sentence. One you brought on yourself. Now, please leave my office. You junkies make me sick. Is, is something Roy just whispered to me. Perhaps it was all just a lucid dream. So the thing I want to do now is jump out to you guys and, and get a couple of audience questions for about the next 15 minutes um, because then we get to go to the bar. Um, so David, please. to the point at which people employing this technology could actually become closed to us, but could, could become uninterpretable, simply because the kind of relationships that normally hold between brains and environments cease to hold for them. 
Um, and, you know, I just wonder if anybody has any ideas about that or whether it's a danger or even a sort of strange opportunity that could be sort of opening, could be in prospect. So, Nick, how far can we go? Yeah, how far can we go? I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I really like this sort of idea. I think there's a, we, there's a fundamental human right of bodily integrity. So I can't do something to you that you don't want me to do. But a sort of corollary of that is the right of cognitive liberty. So I can't make you think something or I can't take a thought from you. And, and so we make choices about the sort of information we release to other people. And the, the environment that we live in now, which, uh, where a lot of our interactions are mediated through computers, so we're never in pres uh, present together, um, I think that f uh, focuses this debate on, how, how, uh, on what our selves are when we interact with people. Uh, can technology intervene in that conversation? I don't know. I suspect it can. We can we, there's a suspicion we can use some of these devices as lie detectors or... Uh, lie detection enhancers, so we can use them to make people reveal things they didn't want to reveal. That's, that's, a, that's an intervention into cognitive liberty. Um, I, I don't know, I think that's a very, that's a very interesting thought to, to think about. Just getting someone drunk is intervening into their cognitive liberty. I mean, that's, yeah, that's um, neuro-enhancing technology as well in some way. I mean, alcohol or, um, and it's very old, but. And yes, but I suppose precisely because it's been around, we're, we're familiar <laughs> with its effects, and we, you know, there are kind of. Yeah. I mean, if people were, for example, able to alter their disposition to aggression or their disposition to feel uh, sexual desire, but in ways that don't actually show overtly, you know, apart from the specs on the behaviour, they might become much harder to read. I mean, I, I, I just mentioned that. That's Backer has an article in the Midwest Journal of Philosophy. It's a story called Crash Space, which explores this possibility, and I, I heartily recommend it. It's well worth looking at, as well as the, the postscript. It just explores precisely this, this this possibility of, you know, in a sense, humans, some humans becoming part of a different species almost, because we're actually quite. Um, you know, because of a series of interventions in, 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 in their, their, their sort of uh, ethical, sort of emotional dispositions. Just a brief, brief comment to that is, I would call it an information security of a neurosocial network issue. You know. So you, you're talking about hacking the brain hacking device? Well, in, in, in a sense, Martin unfortunately is not around. He is pretty much done with the code that allows to uh, network uh, various BCIs uh, and also stimulators if they're connected uh, over a common API via TCP IP, of course. So it, it's coming. It's not, just uh, so an, it's not just an issue about individual liberty. It's an issue yeah. about mutual intelligibility and the, the point at which that might break down. Yeah. yeah. So it's I, I think there's a danger in portraying it purely as a, a libertarian. Although yeah. that's obviously important too. Um, this is a question um, for Christine, but it comes from the comment that Roy made, and possibly Nick has a, has a comment to make on it as well. But we kind of said the thing about um, it's good for some brains and it's detrimental for others. And you mentioned you wouldn't necessarily give it to your undergraduates, uh, albeit, um, like daily um, for months. Um, so how do we start? Um, figuring out is there like a, a process or protocol that maybe like from being a historian into these sorts of like medical sort of situations how would you start you know finding out how you know which brains are you know s suitable for it which brains are not suitable for it? I mean we had grave diggers <laughs> back in the day and you know there's self-experimentation is like rife within you know our past when it comes to scientific and medical things especially when it comes to detrimental so like is there something that you can draw upon as an example that could possibly shed light as what we could do to find out? I can't, because um, the, the history, I, I know extremely little about history of medicine. My branch of history is more into artificial intelligence and ro robots, so uh, I haven't really looked at examples like that, you know, this kind of medical dilemmas of uh, how do you s even start yeah. 
digging into that. So like, you know, how are you going to try and do this safely or even find out this very, very important question? Like, we need to right. be able to do this in, the, in a certain the way. The guys used to do in trials. So <laughs> I, I, I think when you're starting to have um, data, you can then look if you have any predictions which, for example, physiological markers or behavior markers are linked to the um, cognitive ability that you would like to change and see if the uh, if stimulation has different degrees of efficacy based on this physiological and um, individual traits. So it's kind of like a softer approach to it. Kind of that's a first, that's a that, that's a first approach, and then of course you would like to start to individualize it. I'm going to amend my answer. Okay. If the human brain project is successful, which is a massive long shot, <laughs> okay. and we actually manage to make one of the goals of the human brain project, which is a bit utopian at this stage, is to be able to do experiments that you cannot do in humans uh, in silico, so make uh, simulated experiments. Okay. So uh, whether this is going to work out or not, the idea is like, yeah, can you simulate a brain? Uh, and well, I don't really like the idea of just thinking of a human person as just a brain. This is very wrong in my view. But OK, if they are simulating a brain in a computer and eventually putting a simulated body around in a simulated environment and giving it simulated drugs or simulated simulation, stimulation, that's getting really weird, <laughs> and trying to see what happens depending on various types of brains. OK, that's, I suppose, is part of the idea of why this kind of uh, simulation approach is also undertaken, because more and more, even animal experimentation is, is more and more called into question. It's not just human right, experimentation. So. Yeah. Yeah, Do, uh, I just want to co comment on this. It's, th there's something we've sort of alluded to, which is the distinction between treatment and enhancement. So. So uh, I think most of us, when we think about the ethics and the acceptability of doing something, we think it's much more acceptable to treat a deficit that somebody has, maybe through a stroke or through right. old age or dementia, rather than giving the same, same protocol to a college student to make them better at passing exams. Yeah. So why do we worry about things like uh, extended protocols, so doing the same thing day after day? Yeah. It's because we've tried this. Ah in people with, uh, say, numerical difficulties, which Roy has done, or people with uh, other cognitive difficulties, yeah. and s shown that doing things once a day for one week or two weeks has a long, like, uh, multi-month long effect. So we know in clinical populations you can have a long-term effect from some of these protocols. And these are people who are already deficit in Yeah, that's right. So Not only, though. Yeah. Also on healthy volunteers. So, so what we... So what we're looking at with what we're looking at is balancing the potential benefit with the potential risk, and because people who already have a disorder have a different equation of, of uh, benefit and risk, then it's we 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 do things to them that we wouldn't do to say otherwise healthy undergraduates. Say so. Having done that to to such um, populations um, for a weekly basis for a while, like has there been incidences of it being detrimental to them as well? I mean, how were you dealing with that? Exact same issue, Luciana, and your. So when, we, when I worked as a therapist, we'd take clients, and some of the uh, disorders would be uh, a hyperactivity, such as ADHD, so too much beta waves and gamma waves, you know, too much faster activity, yeah. inability to focus and kind of concentrate. Um, it would begin with a, a total brain map being recorded and a three-hour uh, initial consultation to see if you were actually suitable, which had to also be paid for. It's all private, so following that consultation and Q quantitative EEG map, uh, the software, the Loretta and the NeuroGuide would suggest a symptom checklist of hundreds of different potential areas which were, according to the Z-score database, which is constantly updated, this massive database of every single individual hertz of the EEG recording on all the different regions in conjunction with the Brodmann areas, which they use very, which I was talking to Christine about, I didn't know about Brodmann areas until this uh, time. Apparently, it's since 1905. But um, 
been working with the brain about 25 years, and uh, then the software would suggest. So you had the human elements, the software elements, and you know, obviously the physical person in the room telling you how they feel. And profiling from the original map. Yeah, and then from that, you know, the, the company would choose to either take them on as a client, a patient that they could help, or potentially say, well, I'm sorry, we can't actually help you with your particular, you know, it could be stress, but stress with migraines, maybe not. So um, not everyone's suitable. David, please. What is it that prevents another kind of test from taking place? Uh, we've heard that uh, one thing that's holding up adoption is that there aren't very good, there isn't very good evidence so far of the eff effectiveness of these devices and of the long-term safety. And uh, you asked Andrew, well, Andrew, why don't you come up with this? And Andrew's answer was very fair. He said, well, he doesn't have the money to do it, and it's not possible to get the money. But why can't there be smart, edgy, uh, corporate companies, enterprise companies, let's imagine gaming companies who already make a lot of money by selling consoles, let's like say in, in Nintendo or Sega, why don't they put a lot of money into doing a trial with gamers, a proper trial that would meet all the clinical tests. They would actually pay volunteers and the volunteers wouldn't know which of them were getting placebos or not. If not gamers, then maybe Nike would do a test on sports lovers or Virgin, you know, would just do one because Virgin's that kind of edgy company, or you might have a, a wealthy Silicon Valley entrepreneur with transhumanist sympathies like Peter Thiel. What is it that stops them funding such a thing? Is there a hold up in legislation? Is there something that legally stops this? Or is it simply that these companies don't believe that it's possible? I don't know if I want to jump in. I, I don't know why people don't do that. In fact, Think, which is a company we've mentioned that produce a, a really beautiful looking uh, stimulator, it might not be a brain stimulator, but it's a stimulator nonetheless. That's a, a, a venture capitalized company which has done scientific tests. It's engaged neuroscientists to do these safety and efficacy tests. Why aren't there more of them? I don't know. Uh, I, my guess is probably uh, caution. But there's, no, no, there's nothing that stops it. There is a barrier to taking that, the information they generate and putting it into the scientific literature, which is the, the need for a sort of po properly constituted ethical review process. But that's a, that's a, a surmountable barrier. So, uh, so my answer is I don't know why, why there isn't more the money in this. It's partly along the, these lines, you say. The company think. Well, Ray, I wonder your opinion no, specifically on think perhaps or? I would not go with for ah. think because um, yeah I think that um, I, I just want to, to answer actually your question uh, a potential answer for that is that these devices are relatively simple um, you can do it yourself if these companies put so much money they want just like any drug companies to put IP to block other users and to make money right this is what their aim is, is not to make a better world. Maybe the secondary aim, the, the, the primary aim is to make money. Um, and it's really going to be tricky for them to really um, prevent from other people just to do whatever you know, they did and just do it at home. They or could not. Countries. Pardon? Or other countries. And I still want to know what the toys are and where they're from. But anyway, we'll get there, we'll get there when we start. Drinking. I'm going to take a question here and then a question here and then I think we're, that's the time to go to the bar. So after, after you, sir. Um, I wonder if uh, the panel would like to consider whether the whole thing about electrical simulation is a red herring based on some experience in the 90s I had with regards to research into epilepsy. I was looking at drugs which um, reduce uh, epileptic seizures and one of the effects of seizures is that different parts of the brain uh, neurons fire off together in something called burst firing. And I did a lot of modeling of drugs and things and how they acted on the brain and also anesthetics. And one of the outcomes of that was that a lot of the effects that we see aren't things that you can attribute directly to a biochemical or even electrical basis, but it could go right down to even quantum levels. So that's one thing. Another thing was the relationship between the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems and how those two relate. And the third factor, as you've already mentioned, are other things such as the immune system and the gut and how they contribute to the brain function. So given there's all these other things that could affect our consciousness and how they function, are we being a bit narrow and thinking we can make a change just with a bit of electrical stimulation to the brain itself? Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, we are. But, but, but it works. You know, it works in some people. You can see it's reproducible. And I, I said right at the start of all this that we don't know the mechanism. So, so I know if I slap an electrode on an undergraduate's head, then chances are their behavior will change in some way. But I don't know how or why. And that, that's, that's why I think some of this, the space that we're working in is a bit dangerous, because we don't understand what we're doing. Um, so uh, so there's, uh, some of you might know about deep brain stimulation, which is very effective in treating Parkinson's disease, for example. And seizures. And seizures, and many, many other disorders. We don't understand how it works. It's really effective, but we don't know why. And uh, so there's a gap in our knowledge which allows us to produce an effect to, to do things to people that we don't know how it's working. And we're still catching up on why that works. So, so it's true that we can't get to the mechanism yet, but hopefully it's there somewhere. I, I just want to add, I, I think that, you know, you're a bit pessimistic here. <laughs> I think that we know some of the mechanisms. We do not know, of course, we don't have a full picture um, because it's, despite the idea that it is the idea that by Christine that it is invasive, we're not really penetrating into the the brain, and we cannot record from neurons there and have you know understanding at the mechanism that cellular and molecular uh, neuroscientists would like to have. But we know what's affect you know in 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 terms of you know functions of the brain or even neurochemicals. Um, in the brain, um, but there is a limitation of how much we can really know. Um, just one more thing, um, you know, you talk about drugs, for example, and so on, why brain stimulation will not have effect in this case? Mm, final question from you, um, so I, I'd like to um, say some thoughts that came to mind during the talk, rather than actually a specific question, but I'd like to see what you think. Um, so, if you inflect your voice at the end of it, then <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I was thinking how um, so everything the brain does is an extension of the brain, right? So your clipboard right there is an extension of the brain. It's, it's the brain extending itself, and, that, and that's really what we do as humans, right? That's what we, we extend. That's what makes us so special. And this is a tool, and it is but a tool that we use for ourselves, and we can use it for whatever we want. I like the idea of being able to use these to put at my work desk to make me to have happy thoughts when I sit at my work desk so I can train myself. So I've actually extended uh, the form of training myself or some sort of Stockholm Syndrome to myself um, via this thing so I can sit at my desk and actually do the work and do the things I want to do. Um, at least that's the, that's, least that's the hope. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's true. But then the thing is how um, extending your mind with, with uh, like psychoactive drugs, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm personally a big fan of ketamine. I really like that. I've been thinking for a while, yes, it's illegal. But Johnson Johnson now sell this in America as an antidepressant. We were talking about depression earlier. What is the definition of depression? Have we actually defined it? No. So actually, maybe it's, it's the brain not being able to uh, create new neuronal pathways because to train things, they, they, they find it difficult. You know, they, they, to get up and do something. And this is what ketamine did, does. It's, uh, it, it gets you up and does something. It, it gives you uh, a feeling of wanting to get up and wander to get up and do something. And the, it, it sort of gives it into... Well, it's, 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 it's lucidity with a disassociation. So, you know, for those who haven't had a lucid dream, can explore an anaesthetized, semi-anaesthetized version. And I think, I think that's... I think it's actually the opposite, but it's a different... Uh. Unless you end up in a K-hole. But uh, I, think the, the, I think that's an entirely other panel, and that's a panel that which we're going to explore a little bit in March, the 29th of March, where we're going to be talking about cyberdelics using VR to, to um, evoke a, a psychedelic experience. I know you're, you're going to be involved to some degree with that, with uh, James, who you should all meet afterwards. But I want to make sure that we get time to go to the bar. They keep this place open until midnight, but let's not talk uh, till then. And it seems that... We've, we've kind of got to the end of this panel and there's still so many questions. The devices are available, we've accepted that. There's brand new questions, there's brand new issues that are uh, emerging. How do we allow for cognitive liberty and how do we allow for consumer choice? I mean, is the language even correct with how we're talking about invasive versus non-invasive? But I think one of the things that perhaps distilled um, during this, this 
panel at least a little bit was maybe we're just we're fooling ourselves by just focusing on the one organ. Maybe we're a connected entity, and maybe when we talk about stimulation, we shouldn't just focus on the thing in our skull. So I want to end with this, how we always end these events. The future is always virtual, and many things that seem imminent, 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 uh, or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction, though, on, and sometimes on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that tonight. The bar is now open. <laughs> Please join me in thanking these fantastic panelists and of course, Stephen, our science fiction author.